Jesus was not a historical person. That's the rising belief according to a 2022 UK survey entitled Talking Jesus Report. Of the UK population surveyed, there has been nearly a 10% drop in belief that Jesus was a real historical person, from 61% in 2015 to 54% in 2022. Leading the demographics are young people ages 18 to 24, with only 49% believing in the historical Jesus. And of people surveyed that believed that Jesus did exist in history, 58% believed that he's just another human being, not God, leaving around 20% of the UK's population with the view that Jesus was and is God in human form. Now, that's a lot, and I have a question for you. Have you ever wondered, did Jesus really live in the dust and details of real history? You know, maybe he's a mythical figure. Maybe he's a fictional figure. Maybe he was some necessary ideological centerpiece. I mean, practically everyone has one of those these days, don't they? something concocted Orwellian style to justify a group's grab for power. Or maybe there's no way of really knowing, you know? There's so much misinformation out there in our modern digital age. How can anyone honestly hope to know the truth, let alone trust such a claim like God once walked amongst us in the person of Jesus? And since we're asking questions, I think most of us wonder about something even more fundamental, even more practical, namely, why on earth does it matter? I mean, most of us are getting on just fine without Jesus, right? Uh, so how exactly does one person's existence or non-existence affect my life at all? As it stands, I'm thinking about my family, my career, the injustices around the world, the economy, and my up-and-coming holiday, and what to watch next on Netflix, and not some religious person who may or may not have lived 2,000 years ago. I think if we are to group these concerns and questions into two distinct categories, they may sound something like the following. Number one, what exactly do the facts say about Jesus? And number two, why does the historicity of Jesus matter today? Those two questions will be the focus of this brief two-part introductory lecture on the historical Jesus. And to be honest with you, I'm tempted to begin with why Jesus matters today. In the digital age, as we scroll through our feeds, we see the magnitude of the brokenness of our world. And if we're being honest, the brokenness of ourselves. Jesus matters today, not only because of his unparalleled diagnosis of root causation of the brokenness we observe, but also because of the unparalleled remedy for such brokenness. Stick with me till the end, and I'll explain what I mean. First, what exactly do the facts say about Jesus? Was he or was he not a historical person? Now, the study of the historical Jesus and his first century Mediterranean world, sometimes referred to as the quest for the historical Jesus, is an enormous and fascinating interdisciplinary academic field of research. Now, as I said in the beginning, some have suggested that Jesus was an ideological centerpiece, fictitious, or mythological. Uh, multiple authors under the Christ myth theory umbrella. Those who hold such views may hold that Jesus did not exist, but even if he did, so the claim goes, the historical Jesus of history bears minimal, if any, resemblance to the Christ of faith. Or perhaps Jesus was an extraordinarily gifted first century rabbi and 
apocalyptic prophet that was exalted to divine status by his followers because they simply could not cope with his sudden execution by the Roman and Jewish authorities. Claims such as these make for tantalizing headlines, curious documentaries, and high engagement content for TikTok clips. If you've never heard of such theories or authors, then you may not have come across more popular voices, some of whom are writing beyond their range of expertise. Here are four examples that you may have come across. The late Christopher Hitchens wrote about the, quote, highly questionable existence of Jesus. Richard Dawkins, professor emeritus of biology at University of Oxford, wrote, quote, it is even possible to mount a serious, though not widely supported, historical case that Jesus never lived at all. Mikhail Onfray, a highly prolific author and philosopher, wrote in his book, Atheist Manifesto, The Case Against Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, that, quote, Jesus' existence has not been historically established. No contemporary documentation of the event, no archaeological proof, nothing certain exists today. We must leave it to the lovers of impossible debates to decide on the question of Jesus' existence. And finally, just one more for you. Robert M. Price, a secular agnostic New Testament scholar and champion of the Christ myth theory, cautiously writes, quote, there may have been a real figure there, but there is simply no longer any way of being sure. Though these individuals are putting to pen what so many believe in 2022, namely that Jesus never existed or very probably never existed, a belief which appears to many as being firmly grounded in midair. But this pushback of being firmly grounded in midair, um, such groundlessness, is a position not coming only from Orthodox Christianity merely. Such pushback comes from some of the Academy's most skeptical scholars. Consider the following agnostic voice, Bart Ehrman. He writes, Quote, Jesus certainly existed, as virtually every competent scholar of antiquity, Christian or non-Christian, agrees. And I think Bart Ehrman, again a, a secular agnostic, is correct at this point, answering the question, was Jesus a historical person, in the affirmative, appears to be a very reasonable position to hold. But why? I'm so glad you asked. Is this just an argument from authority? By my lights, that which convinces scholars from virtually every stripe is the volume and diversity of indirect and direct available evidence. Skeptics like Robert M. Price, who I just mentioned, will rejoin by stating his skepticism is warranted in the following way, of course. Quote, there might have been a historical Jesus, but unless someone discovers his diary or his skeleton, we'll never know. But how reasonable is it exactly to have such expectations? For example, none of the eyewitnesses of Jesus' life record Jesus having a diary, which really would have been a very unlikely luxury item to possess in the first century. And likely far beyond the means of a homeless, itinerant rabbi. Now, to be fair, Price is more likely seeking after satisfactory historical evidence, and we should as well. So what exists in respect to evidence that attests to the existence of Jesus? In other words, as I've said before, what exactly do the facts say about Jesus? First, there must be some good evidence if the scholarly consensus is that Jesus existed. Consider the following sources at the highest level of the academy. You're going to see a number of sources on your screen right now that confirm this scholarly consensus and that you can read on your own time. With a quest for evidence in mind, 
let's very briefly traverse two categories of evidence that cumulatively support the view that Jesus was indeed a historical person. Number one is the archaeological sources, and we'll call this indirect evidence. And number two, extra-biblical sources. These are sources outside of the New Testament, and we can categorize these as direct evidences. Now, I will only cover archaeological sources in this video, in part one. The extra-biblical sources will be covered in part two of this video. In that second part, I shall also cover the question laid out at the beginning. Why does the historicity of Jesus matter today? Let's jump right into it. The archaeological sources. Now, as we begin, we have to acknowledge that archaeology is difficult. Like, really difficult. Just imagine how many of your things today will be discoverable 2,000 years from now. How difficult would it be to prove that you existed to some archaeologist in the year 4022? It's not easy. I think besides my digital footprint and teeth, I'm not sure if I own anything that would endure 2,000 years. Even skeletons are virtually decomposed after 100 years in a coffin. So how difficult would it be if you lived in the first century? Nevertheless, according to uh, archaeologists on the ground in Israel, they're discovering artifacts on a, quote, almost daily basis, which helps them to corroborate the Bible. As a result, they're able to affirm more and more about the, the people and events and culture that are recorded in the Bible. This is by no means an easy feat, because one must keep in mind other historical facts, like the amount of devastation that some of these cities sustained, like Jerusalem around this period in history. So Jerusalem in 66 AD, for instance, contained zealous Jewish factions that rebelled against Roman rule. Emperor Nero, with his zero-tolerance policies, dispatched his armies to restore order. This was the first Jewish-Roman war, led by Titus with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, being the terminus event for the Jewish rebellion. The Romans essentially burned the city to the ground. So do cataclysmic events like that make finding evidence for Jesus and other New Testament details harder or easier? Well, it makes it nearly impossible. That's beside the point that Jerusalem today is now a densely populated city, which makes archaeological digs even more difficult. Now, keep these difficulties in mind because I'm going to come back to its significance in a moment. Second, we must keep in mind the randomness of history, as Dr. John Dixon calls it. He writes this, quote, the historian trying to reconstruct a picture of what life was like in the ancient world faces innumerable difficulties. What has survived of the writings and buildings of, say, first century Jerusalem, Rome, or Athens would amount to the tiniest fraction of what actually was penned and constructed in that period, much less than 1%. So, for example, he explains that we have countless copies of personal letters, receipts, and so on from everyday average citizens. However, ancient historians do not possess one personal correspondence from Emperor Tiberius who ruled the Roman Empire during the life of Jesus. It's so fascinating. American biblical scholar Craig A. Evans articulates this so well. Quote, if archaeologists and historians could not find any correlations between archaeology and the biblical text, there would be no such thing as biblical archaeology. But of course, they do find such correlations, and lots of it. To be clear, biblical archaeology does not offer direct evidence for the existence of Jesus, but rather indirect evidence. Evidence which supports or corroborates the details of eyewitness accounts written about Jesus in what Christians call the Gospels. With our focus just on the facts, 
what are some of the highlights of biblical archaeology? Well, I'm so glad that you asked. So to start, here are five of them. This is the Pilate's inscription, discovered in 1961, the Pool of Bethsaida, discovered in 1962, the Pool of Siloam, discovered in 2004, the Town of Nazareth, discovered in 2009, and so on. And there are so many more. These are just some of the highlights. Now, you might be wondering to yourself, why are these discoveries so significant and fascinating, I would add? Um, well, in years gone past, certain skeptical scholars adamantly argued that the Gospels, again, the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life, recorded certain details incorrectly or were just plain fictional accounts with some sort of spiritualized meaning. Now, why would they think that? The logic of the argument becomes apparent when we get specific. So, take the Pool of Bethsaida, for example. For 19 centuries, there was no evidence outside the Gospel of John to corroborate its existence. So, the logic is, if John the Evangelist makes a claim that he's writing Jesus' biography and populates it with places that don't appear to exist in the real world, then what is the likely conclusion? Hey, maybe this guy John got it wrong, intentionally or unintentionally. At the very least, some skepticism begins brewing because it doesn't appear that John has firsthand knowledge of the city of Jerusalem, which is odd because he claims to have been there eyewitnessing the life of Jesus. Pushed further, maybe the John guy, whoever he is, either didn't really know Jesus or Jesus never existed. But here's what happened. In 1962, archaeologists found the Pool of Bethsaida. Suddenly, the claims of historical unreliability no longer stick as well as they once did. Similarly, with the town of Nazareth, for centuries, the lack of evidence for Jesus' hometown disturbed scholars. Some, in fact, argued that it didn't exist until after Jesus' time. If Jesus is known for being of Nazareth, then how problematic is it that the Gospel writers call him Jesus of Nazareth? The answer is very problematic. However, in 2009, archaeologists from the Israeli Antiquities Authority discovered a house from first century Nazareth. According to the excavation director, quote, the discovery is of utmost importance since it reveals for the very first time a house from a Jewish village of Nazareth and thereby sheds light on the way of life at the time of Jesus. The building that we found is small and modest, and it is most likely typical of the dwellings of Nazareth in that period. Moreover, biblical scholar James H. Charlesworth lists nine significant archaeological discoveries of tremendous importance, and these are awesome. Charlesworth argues that these help indicate that the places and persons mentioned and described in Jesus' passion narrative are not fictitious. And he lists nine, and you should see that on your screen as well. Some of them include the steps to the temple, the temple, Pilate inscription, and so on. Now, these are really cool and really fascinating. Much could be said about each of these discoveries that help corroborate the existence of Jesus and the reliability of the New Testament. Just one example um, is the crucified man's heel. Guys, this is so cool. This is significant because some scholars argued, based on historical accounts of crucifixion, victims were not properly buried as Jesus was in the Gospels in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. The logic is as follows. The crucifixion of Jesus is a central biographical detail. His biographers claim that he was buried in a tomb. So, if history only provides instances of the crucified being disposed of in, say, 
shallow graves to be picked clean by wild animals, then this cannot be a historically reliable account. However, during an excavation of some tombs in Jerusalem in 1968, an archaeologist made a shocking discovery. In a wealthy 1st century AD Jewish tomb, he discovered an ossuary containing the remains of a man. And this man had been crucified. And this man's heel uh, had a nail still embedded into it. It was an incredible discovery. With respect to the subject matter at hand, this find disproved the objection that I had just mentioned. For it proves that at least some people received a proper burial, just as the Gospels articulated and accurately recorded. Here is the point of this section. If the Gospel writers wrote about certain individuals, say Pilate, and certain settings, say the Pool of Siloam, which furnished Jesus' biography, and we never found any evidence of their existence, then our skepticism towards the historical Jesus and the Gospel would be justified. However, discoveries such as these do support the case that the world and people and cultures that the New Testament writers were writing about were faithfully recorded with precision. All that I have mentioned thus far is indirect evidence facts, data points, and all these you can see and examine for yourself. In part two of this lecture, we will quest even deeper into direct evidence, evidence from outside the New Testament or extra-biblical sources which specifically mention the person of Jesus. Hey guys, how are you doing? My name is Nathaniel and I'm part of the Ocker team. And I just wanted to say a big thank you for watching this film we made. At Ocker, we really love to speak about the big questions of our time and to show how the Christian faith provides credible and valuable answers. If you've enjoyed this film, check out the other stuff on our channel and also please consider subscribing and following us. It really helps to make more films like this. We also wanna hear from you. So if you have any ideas for new content, please put them in the comments below or get in touch with us directly. Thanks goes out to all the speakers, donors, and film team, of which I'm a part of. And actually, fun fact, it takes around 60 hours to make all of these films. And that's because we want to make sure the content is incredibly well-researched, it looks and it flows beautifully, and ultimately, that it's actually useful to you. So this means a lot of research, listening to our audience, and filmmaking. Our incredible staff at Oka who make these films are funded by donations. So if you want to partner with us with our work, please also consider donating which is really easy on our website. See you next time.